So I'm Nick Prococo, and this is Christian, and you're at, this is not the droid you're looking for. Okay. Is that better? Okay, so what you see on the screen is the agenda. We're not going to really talk through it because you're going to see it in the next 50 minutes. But, um, but basically, this is what we're going to talk through today, and let's just jump into the introduction here. So a little bit about me. Um, like I said, I'm Nick Prococo. I'm the um, Senior Vice President and Head of Spider Labs at Trustwave. About 15 years InfoSec experience. I actually built and, and still lead the Spider Labs team at Trustwave. So my interests, targeted malware, attack prevention, you know, mobile devices, and really from a business and social impact analysis standpoint. And, and this is Christian here. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Christian Papathanasiu. Uh, I'm a security consultant at Trustwave based out of London. I've got eight years uh, in InfoSec. Um, my interests are within rootkits, anti-rootkit detection, um, algorithmic trading, which is more financial rate related, and web application security. Okay, so a little, little bit of background in your introduction here. So basically, I'm sure everybody here knows what Android is, and that's probably why you're here. Um, you know, it's you know, 60,000 or 100,000. I don't know how many phones are being sold or activated on a daily basis. It's a very popular platform. Um, from what we were able to find, it ranks about number four in the in the in the in the in the handset or the in the mobile device um, you know, rankings there. So I guess we'll show of hands. How how many people here in the room have Android phones? Wow. <laughs> okay, you guys are all fucked. <laughs> so, no, not really. We're, we're just gonna drop you down a few levels and we'll bring you back up. At the end of this, you'll all be hugging each other. So. Um, <laughs> So basically, you know, not much research here. You know, we, we were able to find um, has been really done in the in the mobile rootkit area, and so there, there's some that's been out there. But basically, you know, Android equals Linux equals you know almost a 20 year old operating system. I remember back when I was you know in, in school, freshman in college, um, installing a very early version of Linux from a big stack of floppy disks, compiling the kernel for about eight or 12 hours, and then to find out it actually didn't work. Um, but, you know, but, but because of that, I'm not saying that that's a bad thing, um, that it's 20 years old. There's a very established body of knowledge around Linux rootkits. And so we were able to find a lot of information that helped us sort of on our journey here. And so what, what did we do? We, we created a kernel-level Android rootkit. Um, it's, it's a loadable kernel module, and it basically is activated or triggered by a, by a phone number, um, so an inbound phone call. So a little bit of background, just, you know, this is a real nice pretty picture here when we, we pulled this from Google. This is basically the model um, for the stack um, that, that, that Android runs on. So basically at the bottom, you see the kernel level, you know, Linux kernel. And at the top, you see the applications. And when I look at this, I sort of think of Time Machine. Um, and and not, the, not the Mac OS, you know, backup utility. I sort of think of the Time Machine, the book, you know, the book or the movie. Um, basically at the top, you have the Eloy. Right, you know, that's, you know, the Eloys are up there, and then and the Morlocks are down at the Linux kernel. Um, the Eloys are like Facebook and Twitter, and, and they're all excited about that, but they don't see anything below the surface, and they don't know what's going on down there. Um, we'll get a little bit more more on that later, but basically, this is what this looks like, and we're going to walk through some of these layers with you. So basically, the Linux kernel um, that's that's the base level there, and it's based on the Linux 2.6 kernel. Um, it is a hardware abstraction layer, so everything above it doesn't have to worry about the hardware, right? Everything's just represented as a file. Um, makes it makes it very, very nice and very clean for, for everything that's above it. Um, it offers the same things that every other Linux kernel offers, you know, memory management, process management, security, networking. Um, but then the whole Android platform that we're going to be talking about really sits um, on top of that kernel. Um, this is where we focused our, focused our attention in the research. You know, we didn't really focus at the, the application layer. Um, we focused at the, um, at the kernel level. The libraries are where most of Android's core functionality lies. Uh, lies. The main libraries of interest are SQLite, which is the main storage subsystem. Um, so Android uses uh, SQLite databases for storing its messages, its contact database, um, and anything really that it needs to store is stored in SQLite databases. Um, for browsing, uh, it uses the WebKit library. Uh, and crypto is handled by the SSL library. So one thing that is interesting uh, based on the libraries that are used is that because it's a SQLite database, you can read, C uh, you can, if you have root access on the device, you can actually read the uh, SMS messages uh, by just using the SQLite cl client. Um, another idea or slash hint is that you can intercept browser sessions by hijacking the library. You can also do that through the kernel. 
And because it's using SSL, uh, the SSL library, and that requires it to be seeded with a prime random, uh, prime uh, random number generator, um, you can see that with static low numbers, and that would mean that your cryptos basically can be cracked easily. So Android's run uh, runtime environment is the Dalvik VM. Um, what is Dalvik? Well, it's a virtual machine on Android devices. It um, runs applications um, which are converted in DEX format. The DEX format is um, specifically designed for um, low memory, low processor speed uh, devices, just like your phone. We didn't spend much time here. The application layer is where your user applications lie, like your Facebook app, your Twitter app, your browser. Um, it's, they usually either come with a phone or they are installed with your market app downloaded from the internet. Um, we didn't spend much time here either. So all your higher layer, layer applications, they ultimately interface with the Linux kernel, um, which acts like a hardware abstraction layer between the um, hardware and your user Linux applications. Therefore, by hijacking the Linux kernel, you, in effect, hijack the higher layer applications. Um, the and then, it, basically, this is where we sort of start to explore, um, you know, the, the, the concept of sort of abstracting um, the, the the rest of the phone, the rest of the functionality of that phone from the end user. So basically, you know, if if you're if you're abstracting everything below the application layer from the end user, that's a usability advantage, right? So your grandma that's using the phone isn't seeing you know you know, you know council messages and things popping up on their screen and all, all sorts of crazy stuff going on. You know, all they know is that they can make a phone call, they can send a text message, they can read their email, and they don't have to learn worry about anything else below. And that's that's great. I mean, that's that's great for a consumer device. Um, but then, complete abs user abstraction in, in that form is basically a s somewhat a security disadvantage, right? Um, if someone's on your phone, and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna show what that looks like. But if someone's on your phone, doing things at the at the kernel level, you have no idea. I mean, you really don't know. I mean, you, you, I mean, I have a phone here, and someone could be on it right now, and I wouldn't know by looking at the screen or using my apps. So that's that's a security disadvantage. And then even if an attack, like an attacker's sloppy, they get on a phone and they are causing problems, they, 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 it causes it to slow down and now you have to reboot it, the end user's not gonna think, well, well maybe a hacker's on my phone. Um, they're basically gonna think that the phone is, is crappy, I need to just reboot it. So, um, so basically, they'll just call it a bug or they'll just reboot their phone and they'll be, and they'll be done with it. So, so what are some of the motivations behind this? So, you know, p people are asking, you know, you know, why did you guys look into this? Why did you guys, you know, write the, the rootkit? And, and basically, this was just sort of a, you know, a, a discussion that, that Christian and I had at, um, at Black Hat Europe, um, talking about sort of the implications of someone um, of rootkits being on mobile phones. I mean, mobile phones are everywhere, right? So these, you know, four, 485 million devices on 3G networks. So that basically means that there are that many devices that almost have an always-on connection, right? So you know, my phone's sitting on my table. Um, it's connected to the internet. You know, it's, it's on the it's on the 3G network. Um, I I go and I drive across town while I'm in the car. It's on there as well. So it's always on, um, which is very similar to what we saw in the you know in the late 90s when people started getting always on connections in, in their home. Um, and some research that we we, we looked into uh, showing that by 2010 there will be 10 billion devices um, on high speed always active on online connections. So. You know that's 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 an incredible growth. You know that's that's it's much faster than you even saw when when, when the PC revolution or the or the the you know, internet revolution took place. I mean, people have, some people have two and three mobile devices that are that are on um, 3G networks. Um, and then the other piece there is that 60% of us, you know, maybe even higher, probably you know much higher percentage of people in this room, um, carry those devices with them at all times. So if you think about, you know, you, you have your home computer, right? You don't carry, well, you may, you may have a laptop, but if you had a home PC and you, it's plugged into your, your home network, you're not carting that thing around with you um, wherever you go. Um, you, know, you know, there's people who probably take their, their phones to the bathroom with them. Um, you probably don't take your PC to the bathroom with you. Um, so basically for high profile and business people, you know, even, even government officials, you know, they probably have that phone with them like, nearly 100% of the time. I know myself personally, I don't think I've had a smartphone leave a two foot perimeter um, from me or maybe a little bit further in probably the last five years. So um, think, of the, think of the implications of someone gaining access to that phone and doing things like turning on um, a camera or listening to a conversation or, 
or, or doing things, other things like that. So, and then the other piece there, the powerful, the, the power nature of, of the smartphone, right? You know, you know, the phone that you have in your pocket today is probably much more powerful than a PC from eight years ago. Um, you know, at least the average PC. And so the other, you know, the location aware piece is, is there as well. You know, you, you can go wherever you want and there's GPS on there and, and, and someone could possibly track you. So there are piece, other little motivations here is that users access highly sensitive information from their smartphones. I mean, how many people here have, have done a single um, sort of financial transaction from their phone that may, may be checking their balance on their bank account or doing something from their, from their smartphone? Oh, we got a handful of people here. Um, and then users typically would trust their smartphones before they would trust like a, another computer, right? I know I would, I, would, I would trust my phone before I would trust like a kiosk at a, at a hotel um, to, to make a transaction or do something. Um, they, you don't really ever tr question the, your phone's integrity, um, but in many cases you don't have any ability, as an end user, you don't have ability to, to interrogate the integrity of your phone. I mean, you get to sit on your desk and you walk away and go to the bathroom, you come back, you, you don't really worry that someone got on your phone while you were gone. Um, An another motivation for this work is that um, lots of times for mobile operators to operate within a certain jurisdiction, they must allow governmental entities access to subscriber information. Um, a, a recent case scenario is in uh, the UAE where a company called Edi Salat uh, pushed a performance update to all their BlackBerry subscribers. Uh, this in essence was um, malware which was intentionally um, installed uh, to allow uh, government officials to monitor BlackBerry users. So BlackBerry users are, in, uh, are likely going to be uh, governmental officials or high-ranking executives or business uh, execs. So that was the purpose. So that, that motivation, um, instead of having, instead of an attacker installing it, we're looking also at a governmental entity or a, C or a communications service provider installing the rootkit on the actual phone and providing it to you shipped. So a bit about what we're not doing here. So what we haven't done is developed a new attack vector to get the rootkit on the phone. And so you know, basically there's a lot of, you know, even people who were here at the previous presentation, there were some, 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 some notes about that as well. Um, you know, we're, we're not, we're not, in, we're not, we're not showing, you know, you're not going to be you know, weaponized um, to be able to attack everybody's phones here at, here at DEF CON after this talk. Um, but what we, what we do, what we did do is we, we developed the rootkit that, um, that, that is, could be the end result, that's the end result, right? So if you have a, if you have an exploit that you, 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 you use our rootkit and deploy on someone's phone, it'll be, it'll be highly effective. And there's other ways, right? So you have, you know, malicious apps that could be deployed that would be able to contain that rootkit on it. And so basically, you know, we, we chose Android, not because we don't like Android. Um, um, you, know, you know, Christian a, has an Android phone, I'm an iPhone user, but it was, there's no bone to pick with, with Android at all. Um, we, we chose it for our research basically because it runs Linux. Um, and, and everyone has access to the source code. Um, and that really, that really aided us in, in, our, in our research and be able to develop this. So let's get on to how we built our actual rootkit. Um, what our rootkit is, is a Linux kernel module. And what a LKM is is, um, is, is, is a software that allows the kernel to be extended dynamically. So usually, if you, want, if you wanted, conventionally rather, to uh, extend your kernel's functionality, what you would usually have to do is um, write the code, recompile your whole kernel, and reboot your machine into that kernel to have it run. Um, LKMs allow you to flash kind of your kernel dynamically and get that functionality installed immediately. So as it's running in the kernel, it obviously has the same um, capabilities as code in the kernel. Um, and LKMs, uh, in our case, were hijacking system calls uh, used for file process and network operations. And these system calls are listed in what is called as a system call table. So imagine that's a big array um, with a whole bunch of system calls um, which are indexed by a system call number. So how does a kernel rootkit differ from a conventional rootkit? Well, early in the late 1990s or uh, early 2000, there was, like a, there was a couple of rootkits out there, one of which was something called TorrentKit. Uh, which replace system binaries like LS, PS, and NetStat. Um, the main um, 
difficulty in, in, in that was that it was easily detected by doing MD5 timestamp uh, hash, hashes on the actual binaries against known good media. So that would detect that your binaries were tampered with, and that would be a telltale sign that something was wrong. So a kernel rootkit um, doesn't replace your system binaries. So if you do your MD5 hash against all your system binaries, they all appear the same. What it does is subvert the kernel. Um, therefore, it, it's more difficult to detect it. So how do we redirect system calls? Um, we redirect system calls by uh, creating a, a hook. And what that, in essence, is, is um, when the system calls a specific system call, we intercept that and call our own code and then redirect it back. So by doing that, we place ourselves kind of like a man-in-the-middle attack for the system call. Um, within that man-in-the-middle, uh, within that middle, is our code, our exploit code, which performs the functions we want it to do. So by hijacking the kernel, we are no, not only subvert the layers above the kernel, but we also subvert the end user himself. While developing this rootkit, there were a few hurdles to overcome. Uh, it, was, it wasn't as straightforward as it would have been on a usual commodity PC, Linux PC. Um, one of the hurdles, uh, which, which exists also on commodity PCs, is to retrieve the system call address. Um, another hurdle was um, to how do we compile the actual module against the, the source code for the device. And another hurdle which uh, we had to overcome was to enable system call debugging which would allow us to um, determine higher layer phone functions, which would, we would then be able to tap into and hijack and uh, perform actions that we want to perform. So in kernels great, um, greater than 2.5, there is a certain memory address called the system call table structure. Uh, which is no longer exported. They did that for security reasons primarily, as uh, in kernels 2.4 and below. Um, this was exported uh, by, this, by the kernel, and it allowed lots of rootkits to um, use this functionality to, use, to get the address of syscall table and then hijack the system calls. Um, recently, around 2006, if I'm not mistaken, um, there was a FRAC article by a guy called SD and another guy called Sevic, I believe, and that was called um, how to, how to um, s obtaining syscall addresses without. Um, he, it, he basically used dev kmem to obtain the syscall table address uh, using certain heuristics. Um, because all Android devices ship with the same hardware, firmware, and kernel. This is not really necessary in our case. So unless a user has actually flashed their device or rooted their device, which most users haven't, um, you can simply obtain the syscall table address from the system.map file of the compiled kernel. Um, this also means that you can obtain lots and lots of targets for different devices, and you can create an installation script which, depending on the uname of the actual uh, device, it loads the specific syscall table address for that specific device. <coughs> we obtained um, target addresses for the HTC legend, for the HTC desire, and for the actual emulator itself. Another hurdle we had to overcome was to um, load our, our kernel module within the actual running kernel. It, it was quite weird because the HTC, HTC legend, HTC rather, they provided the kernel source code for the legend. And you would expect that if you compile a kernel module against it, it would actually allow you to load it onto the device itself. This wasn't the case uh, because the uname of the actual HTC legend uh, was extended by um, saying instead of 2.6.29, which is the actual default kernel provided by HTC, they, the uname said it was 2.6.29, 9A30, 26A7. So when you try to load your kernel, your module into the, uh, into the legend's kernel, um, it said the ver magics don't match, and it wouldn't allow you to do that. 
So we looked into the source code of the actual uh, HTC Legend kernel um, and modified that and then re recompiled uh, the module against it and it allowed us to run, to load the module successfully. The file that we modified to load that was the a file called utsrelease.h. So at this point, we had successfully loaded our module into the HTC Legends kernel. Um, what we next needed to do was to understand which higher layer phone functions we needed, we needed to intercept. Now, all Google Android has thousands, hundreds, thousands of APIs. These all, in the end, interface with a set of 255 to 300 system calls. So the main ones which we were we targeted were the syswrite, sysread, and sysopen, sys, and sysclose system calls. And these are the system calls, these are the functions within the kernel which um, perform all the read, write, open, and close uh, operations. So by determining the arguments that are passed to these system calls, we can find specific events that we want to hijack. So having created this um, syscall debugging uh, script, um, LKM, which is also available on the DEF CON CD, um, it allowed us to print all these system call and their arguments. And this was all found in dmessage. dmessage is basically um, log, a log file which um, shows you all the print k's that we we would show we would send into the that were coming from the kernel with the arguments of those system calls so what we tr what we went on to do was we sent sms messages to the phone we called it and we trapped these events um, we then determined that certain events uh, we can hijack them and proceeded to hijack them to create our rootkit so here's the here's the rootkit itself. So we're, this is a, a tool called um, MindTrick. Um, it's an Android rootkit, and, and basically, you know, we'll explain what it does today, and then we're going to demo it for you. So it allows us to send an attacker a reverse shell over 3G or Wi-Fi. And so basically, um, once the rootkit is loaded on a phone, if if it's if it's if the phone number is defined um, before the of course before the global kernel module is compiled, when it receives a phone number or phone call from that specific phone number, it'll then open up a reverse shell to an IP address that's specified in there as well. So it's basically a trigger. Um, I mean, you could we, you could define multiple phone numbers, you can define multiple places. Um, you know, it's really you know it's C code, so you, you can extend this to it however you want. Um, and then basically, once that happens, the attacker has has root access on the phone, and it's 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 a it's a 3G connection or a Wi-Fi connection, whatever it may be, um, across the internet, wherever you're you're located, and you can you can do whatever you want on that on the user's phone. The user may be on the phone talking, and you're on the person's on that person's phone. Also, the rootkit is hidden from the kernel itself, and so we, we included that um, in in the functionality. And so when you load the kernel, uh, when you load the the rootkit, um, and you look you do ls mod. It doesn't show up. So the source for that is on the DEFCON CD, um, so that you can, if, you, if you're interested, you can, you can play around with it. So now we get to the live demo. Um, and so you know, we, 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 I guess we pray to the demo gods that, that this goes well. We are using a lot of um, wireless technology um, in here, which is always a sort of a curse at, at DEFCON. So, um, so but, but this is what we're going to do. And so I'll sort of list these, and then we'll go to the demo, and, and we'll walk you through them. But basically, we're going to show you how we install the rootkit on the phone. Um, basically, we'll activate the rootkit via phone call, and so we'll, we'll show that. And then you'll see reverse shell open up. And then we'll go through, and, and Krishna will, will basically show you some ex exploration there um, in finding where the SMS messages are, viewing the person's contacts, and, um, and then basically looking up the GPS coordinates as well um, on, on the phone. And then we'll attempt um, to make a phantom phone call. Um, but unfortunately, when we were in the, the speaker ready room, we realized that um, if he calls my phone, um, and he types those commands in on the screen, you're going to see my phone number um, on the screen. And so I'm not sure I really want that. So um, we may disconnect the screen and, and, and run that for you so you can actually see the, um, the, the rootkit calling my phone and making a phantom phone call. Let's jump out. Yep.
So we are connected to the phone right now uh, using what is called the Android, Android debug bridge. And what that is is just an interface which allows you to upload files, download files, um, and get a shell on the actual phone. Uh, this is just, just to allow us to install the rootkit. Um, this isn't an attack vector. This is default functionality provided by Android. So here's the here's the rootkit itself. So you see mindtrick.ko and so. I believe I've already installed the uh, rootkit on the phone. You did. Okay. Yeah, I already installed it. So um, I've already installed the rootkit. Just getting to in, just getting ready for the talk. However, how you would install it is just type install mindtrick.ko, and that would load the rootkit into the actual uh, device. Um, we can see with LSMod that. The two modules that are currently loaded um, are the dub, uh, are the wireless modules for the actual phone. Nothing there denotes anything related to mind trick. So now we will disconnect from the phone and set up a netcat listener. Okay, so now I'm going to attempt to call his phone. And if it works, you should see a shell. Fingers crossed. Gods hate us. <laughs> hmm. I'll just reboot it. Okay, so while we're rebooting the phone, does anybody have a good joke? <laughs> I guess that's what happens when you when you decide to do a run through it in the speaker's ready room. <laughs> Was that a yes back there? Oh, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess a little bit more about the setup here. So basically, um, we we have a Wi-Fi access point, and hopefully that's not the, the reason why that's that's going on. So basically, the phone is on the 3G network, um, Christian's phone. Um, it has the loadable kernel module or when, when it comes up, it should have it loaded on it. Um, and then, basically, when I place a phone call, it should open up a reverse shell. So let's wait a couple minutes. Good thing we have... We, we're fine on time, so... Should I check the Wi-Fi? Can you ping? Yeah, the Wi-Fi should work. Can you ping my... No, yeah. You're trapping the phone, right? Yeah. Fit seven? Mm -hmm. The phone is up. Okay, so, so let's, let's try again. We're connected again to the phone. We'll insmod the rootkit. LS mod shows it's not there. We will now try to disconnect and try again. There we go. There we go. Um, one thing to note is that I have no missed call logs here. Um, I also, um, the phone didn't ring, the volume is up. So that's a functionality provided as well. Yeah, so we're, we're now on the phone. We're now actually connected to the phone. 
um, and we'll run through obtaining the SMS database. Um, my girlfriend has sent me a couple of texts, so I'll, pro I'll probably clear that quite quick, quickly. So, um, and we'll also get the contact database. Um, we'll also try to get some GPS coordinates. Um, try and initiate a phantom phone call as well. So, as I mentioned previously, the uh, Android uses SQLite for its um, storage system. So we will use SQLite to connect to the S SQL database. Uh, sorry, to the SMS database, view those, um, and then likewise for the contacts. nice long path for us. So now it, it's a non-interactive shell, so you won't see uh, you won't see the actual SQL light saying I've connected, but we should be able to see the tables if we do that. So those are the tables. Um, so if we type select star from incoming message, you get all the texts. Um, Uh, another thing we'll do right now is uh, get the contact. So these are all the tables in the contacts database. Um, we'll just select everything from wrong contacts. I don't mind if you see these, it's fine. <laughs> so um, these are all the contact database for the f all that I have on my phone. So the next thing we'll do is um, get some GPS coordinates. And one thing we identified when we were trying to look for the GPS coordinates, um, and we're, we're going to do more research into here, but basically um, the device, um, the GPS device isn't activated unless, a, of course, a, an app that's... Is, is that's actively using GPS. Actively using GPS. And so um, we, we activated um, basically Google Maps um, on the phone here. And so now we'll, we'll see if we're able to retrieve the GPS coordinates on the phone. So these are GPS and MEA cord um, from the serial device, GPS serial device. Um, you can then translate these into Google Maps and get a uh, pinpoint for the actual device. So the next thing we will do is try and, and initiate a phantom phone call. Okay. Um, <laughs> so we'll see how we... Shall we disconnect or... You want to move the screen below? Can you type... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, actually, does anybody else want us to call their phone? <laughs> <laughs> Any volunteers? <laughs> we do? Okay. Well, why don't you come up on stage here and we'll. It doesn't have to be an Android phone, no. No. Okay. Oh, it's a test phone? Cool. We get the number. Is the ringer turned on? Is the ringer turned on? Uh, I can turn it on. Yeah, yeah turn, turn it on. on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's a 650. One. A zero, zero, one, right? 
Yeah, zero, zero, one. Zero, one. Six, five, zero. Six, five, zero. Three, three, six. Three, two, eight, four. Three, two, eight, four. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, one reason somebody would want to do this is let's say they've made a deal with. Um, like a dodgy operator, f f like sex phone operator or something like that, and they want to get some commission, they would initiate some phantom call like this um, and let it on for as long as it as long as it takes. Hopefully, this will work. It takes a while. Let us know if your phone rings. It's ringing. Yeah, it should be a it should be a, a, a London phone number four four area code. Yeah, four. should be a London phone number. <laughs> Great, so that worked. Great. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, so we're gonna go back to the presentation. Okay. This is email. It's email. <laughs> Yeah. There we go. Okay. So we were able to show you. Just full screen here. Yeah. So basically, we showed you all these things here. The shutdown, shutting on the phone isn't very exciting. We just do shut down in the just phone. Just type reboot or reboot, and the phone reboots. Um, but basically, you know, and these are just the functionality that is available, you know, through command line, you know. The, this, this could be extended for with, with automated features. Um, this is a very, very basic rootkit that basically allows you to have that root shell capability. Um, and then it's, it's up to you to, to type those other commands in, like searching the databases and, 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 and pulling down GPS coordinates. So, um, so current prevention. So what's the current prevention look like? And this is really, you know, really the main motivation. Um, you know, one of the main motivations we spoke about is just sort of raise awareness here. So um, we tested both Lookout Mobile Security and Norton smartphone security um, on, on, on this phone with the loadable kernel module or the rootkit loaded and neither detected it. So that's, that's pretty big awareness there. So there's not a lot of technology out there or solutions out there for, for end users or for any of us to go and, and, and basically prevent or protect ourselves from these types of attacks. So really, you know, so what can be done? You know, what, what can manufacturers do? So manufacturers could ensure that uh, all device drivers, LKMs, are si must be signed by, let's say, HTC, not self-signed by the developers themselves, uh, before they are actually loaded into a kernel. Uh, perhaps not allow you to root your device. That would also help. But uh, personally, I wouldn't like that because I like having that functionality. But um, centrally signing would be the ideal way to go for to, to prevent things like this. So some of the conclusions. So you know, through our little journey here that we, we embarked a couple of months ago, we found that it's you know it is definitely possible to write a rootkit for the Android platform. Um, you know, of course, we didn't include any other functionality. Uh, we didn't really go much deeper, um, but it easily can be done. So I'm sure there's people in this room that will take the source code off of the CD and, and play around with it and see what else they can do. Um, but then. Very little attention has been played, you know, to smartphone security up until this point. I mean, we, there's been great, great talks the last few days, and even at even at at Black Hat around this topic. And I think I think the industry is going to really, um, really start moving in that direction. Um, but basically, it's you know, it's it's really because you know all of us are using our phones nowadays, and even you know the next five years, it's going to really expand to the point where we rely on those devices um, more than we're going to rely on our on our PCs or our laptops. So in the next 10 years, you know, we're going to see an explosive growth in, in mobile devices. And just with how the, you know, with the internet boom, when you started seeing explosive growth in, 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 in home computers and, and other things going on that are connected to the internet, you saw it you, sort of right in, on path, you started seeing explosive growth in malware and, and viruses and other things. Um, so there's no reason why we're not going to see the same thing happen for, for mobile devices. So, so the big bottom line question is, you know, will we be prepared for that? And that concludes our talk. Uh, thank you very much for your time.